people in some of the world's biggest organisations know very, very little about data, and let alone the inefficiencies they create. It takes my team, on average, about four hours to process a simple contract. Why is that? It's because we have to go across three or four different systems, we have to do three or four different reports, we have to check this, validate that, deliver this, email that, and before we know it, there's been at least three or four hours. And we're meant to be the experts. Lots of companies have lots of systems that have lots of data, and I'm all about helping them get the most out of using those properly. Helping people look at strategies for growth, upsell and cross sell. Businesses are about selling. So we help them identify where to find more of their existing customers and do more with their existing customers, and then find new customers. And then looking at integrating those across platforms. There's all sorts of different weird and wonderful things out there now, though. You've probably heard of things like Salesforce, potentially, or Sugar, which are some of the better known CRMs, but nowadays we've got things like Marketo, Hadoop, and all sorts of silver pop, and various weird and wonderful names out there. And my job is about trying to understand those, not from an expert point of view, but making sure the business can actually use them and use them properly. So, let's talk a little bit about the... I'm a firm believer in letting someone say something if, I can, if they can say it better than myself. So I just want you to watch this because it does help some of some stories about uh, stuff we talk about. Okay. Introduction to what I'm going to talk about today. Some of that is really scary if you ask me. Um, there's, there's technologies and practices out there that weren't even thought of probably a year or two ago, let alone as recently five years ago. And what's to come in the future is probably even mind boggling. So, Netflix, I'm sure people have heard about that or at least read about it or heard, seen it on the news. What they're actually going to do with Netflix is find ways to look at the data usage of their customers and then use that to predict which shows to sell. So when you watch MasterChef or The Block or whatever it is you're going to watch, they will take that sort of information, they will put it into their big propeller machines and spit out an algorithm that says, okay, well based on this we should build a show that shows people cooking eggs while building a house. Okay? It's all about bringing that information together and delivering insight. So, as I said before, let's talk a bit about the data. is nothing new. Okay, people act like it's this big scary monster that saw something popped up out of nowhere and people are expected to try and get their heads around it. But I remember back when I was in primary school more than a few years ago, and computers actually went in the classroom. When I was in high school, a few years later, if you could do control bold, control underline, control metallic, that was considered as being bold. Groundbreaking. Okay? And people used to have the big punch cards. I'm not sure whether you've seen it, but there's all those old movies from the 80s and 90s where the computer is this big machine about the size of a room. Okay? It's nothing new. All that's changed is what we expect of it. The point I want to make today is data should be valued, used, and used well. The reason being is you can get data from anywhere about almost anything. It's what you do with it that matters. Okay? 
and the, one of the main points I'm going to make today is about making sure it's valuable for you as a user and for the purpose for which you want to use it. Just a little preaching from me before I get started. Data cannot be any of those things. No matter how hard you try, you might want to step outside the process of communication and circulation of data within your systems, but you cannot. It is there. It will sit there. Whether you use it or not is up to you. Whether or not you use it correctly is up to you. But it cannot be switched off, underestimated, unavailable or ignored. It will be there. It will sit there. Today you have to sign a form about using your photos. I remember when I was in primary school, I went, yeah, just put your photo out there. You have to sign forms almost for anything nowadays because of privacy, because of how it's going to use, because of the intention of it. WikiLeaks is a classic example now, where you put data out there. You didn't care about the impact, you just put it out there. Hoped for the best. What I want to talk about today is what data can be. And those are just some words I dreamed up in about five minutes. It's a whole mm -hmm. lot more things. Some descriptors there which are just really interesting and also somewhat frightening when you think about it. So data can be big. Anyone brave enough to give me an idea of what big data is or means or is about? Any brave souls? I don't know the right answer, by the way. So I'm going to take a stab at it, but I want to know if anyone wants to have a stab at it. No? Tough crowd. So at least has a shot. Okay, that's cool. Big data is about lots and lots of data, making lots and lots of mess, and trying to get lots and lots of information out of it. No one really knows the true, true definition. There are data scientists now. There are data analysts now. There are data warehouse engineers. You ask all of them, they will give you a different definition. Big data is basically the world's way of saying, geez, there's a lot out there. That's how I see it. Let's talk about the fact that it needs to be digital, automated, and immediate. People want information now. Not five minutes from now, not ten minutes from now, not yesterday, not the day before, right now. If I want to run a piece of analysis, I'm expected to do it straight away. If you want to know what your bank balance is, out comes your phone, off you go. If you want to know how much you owe on a bill, put it straight away. Same thing goes for businesses. They want insight straight away. The longer they sit on the insight, the longer it takes them to do something with it. Very, very important. And nowadays, they want it automated because they're lazy. Lots of executives in big offices sitting there going, I just want to push a button and out comes a report. I guarantee you, ask the CEO of my organisation, how do you use Salesforce, Gareth? Do we have Salesforce for them? Okay, I guess we do. So, okay, well, what reports would you like out of Salesforce, Gareth? Not sure. Why don't you go speak to the sales people? So I'll go speak to the sales director. Sales director, what would you like out of Salesforce? Something pretty quick and easy, thanks. What about what in it? I don't know. And round and round and round we go. So people don't just want information, they want it in their own way, in their own time, and they want it quickly. Let's talk about social and expendable. Social media is frightening. I, I shudder to think what it would be like for my four-year-old to come in and I just, I just kind of mean to think about it. But it's out there. People think their opinions are important, whether they're right or wrong. All right. LinkedIn is a classic example. It used to be a business networking tool. Now I see people talking about articles, about holidays, about something that was really nice to them, about their peers, about lunch, all sorts of stuff. Gone are the days where it was just purely for business because people think, people want to hear about what they have to say. <coughs> Twitter, not even on the thing, but I don't get it. Okay, yes you want to tell people what you're doing, but are you really that important? Not that you seem important, but are you really that important? But it's another example of immediate information right now, where you want it, when you want it, straight away. Let's talk about uninformed and unsolicited information. Spam emails, hand up, who gets one? Yeah. How many of you actually just delete straight away? I'll give you an example of a typical conversation that I had with a marketing manager. Marketing manager, Phil, I'd like a quick and easy way to email, to talk to my clients. Okay, what would you like to do? Oh, we'd like to put together a message, send something out there. Oh, okay. So what are you thinking? Oh, look, email's really cheap and easy. Okay. Why do you think it's cheap and easy? Well, you just send it, off it goes, you don't have to do much. Oh, okay. So how often do you get an email, John? Oh, every couple of minutes. Okay. If it's not from someone you know, do you read it? No. What do you do? Delete it. Okay. So you want me to sell you an email that you're most likely to delete? Yeah. <laughs> it straight happens. And I, I, it never ceases to blow my mind 
how many times I had that conversation, especially now with the privacy laws. As of March 12th last year, you cannot email a person unless it's for the purpose for which it was collected. Which is, if you read into it, it's quite true. There used to be a bit of grey and there used to be all sorts of interesting people with interesting coloured hair in call centres who find ways to get an email address. But now, an email must be used for the purpose for which it was collected. So if you're at a trade show about printers and you give out your business card, those people at the printing show can call you an email, but you'd be surprised how many businesses try to buy into that. To give you an idea, last year, one of our competitors wrote, I think it was about one and a half million dollars worth in the email list part of their business. This year, they anticipate it coming down to about 250, 250,000. Why? Because the rules are tightening it, but also the expectations are even getting tighter. Let's talk about uninformed. I can go onto LinkedIn right now, call myself the CEO of Dun & Bradstreet Australia. Who's going to stop me? No. LinkedIn is fantastic, as is, see, as is all the other information sites out there. But you can pretty much put whatever you want without really having to validate it. Think about that. You can go in there and put almost anything. It's almost like when you used to, the old days, you used to you know, fudge your CV a little bit to try and help you get that job. Yeah, I managed to tell them uh, 10 people who got You can do that online now. You can say, oh, I've done this awesome project on this and this and this. When really, all you really did was read an article about it. So there's nothing stopping people now going into that space and just being completely uninformed. And the scary thing is there's so much out there, there's no one there to validate it or check it. Let's talk a little about spam and commoditizing of that. So as I mentioned before, lots and lots of spam out there, lots of stuff just out there. It used to be back when I, even when I started at Dun & Bradstreet almost five years ago, we used to be able to walk up to a business like Erica and say, buy our data, we're the best in the business, here's 300,000 records, off you go. That'll be 100,000 dollars. Why? Because we're done in Red Street and we say so. Nowadays, there is just so much out there, and so much of it's free. There's data cooperatives. It used to be there were food cooperatives and hippie communes. Now it's data cooperatives. So, gone is the day where you could sit, sit there and just go, well, I've got the best data, who wants it? Now there's so much data out there that people go, you know what? I feel like getting a bit from here, and I feel like getting there. I might put it together and see what comes. Give you another example of a conversation I had about a week and a half ago with the sales manager of a large photocopier distributor, Red Brandy. I'm not telling you this, but I'm sure you He says to me, he goes, Phil, I really like your data, but I think I can get some better lists from associations we're part of. Oh, okay. What data are they going to give you, Rob? Well, they're going to tell me who makes it, you know, who distributes it, um, you know, and it's free. Okay. What about people who are going to buy your data, Rob? And buy your printers, right? Oh, I hadn't thought of that. Okay, it gives you an idea of how people are just so excited about free, easy, cheap, large data that they stop caring about what they're going to do with it. And that's the point I'm going to keep coming back to. Ah, and more importantly, tweak it to suit your purpose. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So, just some scary facts. I looked at, I was trying to find some really explosive ones. I was trying to find one to settle on, and I just couldn't find one. Some of those are just absolutely mind boggling. 204 million emails per minute. I do about 300 a week, 400 a week. Give or take. They're the ones I keep. I'm sure there's more out there. Facebook likes. What the heck is that meant to mean? You like something? Fantastic. What does that mean for your business? A number of businesses now use Facebook as the centre of their digital strategy. Yet, all they know about is, oh, it's free. I can put a page up there, people can like me. My wife's a classic example. She put her graphics business up there a couple of weeks ago. I've got 308 likes. How many of them are doing business? Okay. It's all about making sure you get the most out of that data. Google. Google used to be just a search engine. Now it's its own business with its own lists and a frightening set of data. You go in there as a business and ask what data resources they have. It is scary. They can track where you are, where you've been, where you're going to go, what you're going to buy. But, no one really knows how to use it. CD-ROMs. I don't remember what a CD-ROM was I do. Lots of them out there. Scary to know that you can actually store, store that much data 
can go around the world and alter the moon. And talking about email messages, 80%, I think that's generous, I think it's probably 95% of spam. I reckon it's more than that, the amount of junk we get. Every time I get home and there's a new email in my spam box, I go, what have you signed up for now? And up it comes. So, we've talked about data, we've talked about using it for certain points of view, we've talked about getting the most out of it. I'm an unashamed <laughs> Star Wars fan, by the way, I'll qualify that saying. Okay? What I want to talk about is what happens when you have all that data and use it to come up with your own conclusions. And if what happens is more importantly if you're not careful. So data truths are from a certain point of view. And the guilty culprit, culprit is this very university. This is on your website. And the information I'm about to show you is from three lines on the same table on the same page. All right? Three lines on the same table on the same page. Remember that. I didn't have to go to separate pages. I didn't have to go anywhere else. This information I'm about to tell you is literally three lines on the table. And the point I want to make here is depending on how I read that table, there are a whole heap of different messages that can come out of it. So let's talk about RMIT in 2013 versus 2012. An increase of 5.17%. Party time. <laughs> if you're a business, bonuses. Everyone's going to Italy for a holiday. Outstanding. That's what that, that's, that's what that sort of number tells you. Phil, would that be good for the university? That would be strong, wouldn't it? So it's very important to think about that in context. All right? That shows full-time students. It's from a table. It's about the university. Right, how awesome is that? But... On the same table. At the same time, total enrolment only went up by 1.17%. Completely different view. From the same table, about the same university, from the same set of data, just two separate columns apart. All right? It's all about the message I'm trying to tell my reader. And by completely... <coughs> different sets of views, I could be either really, really happy or really, really sad. Classic example I'll give you is a client of mine, large retailer that starts with B. They serve tradespeople. We've got every single trade covered, Phil. Okay. What about plumbers? Yep. Look at their data. So what makes you think this person's a plumber? He buys lots of pipes. Okay. Right. What's the name of the business? Oh, such and such enterprises. Okay, look up the address. Do you realise such and such enterprises actually is a publishing business? Oh, okay. Can't explain that. Why do you think that is? Well, maybe the handyman went in. Sure enough, we dug around and the handyman was the one shopping on behalf of the business. The pipe had broken, he wanted to go shopping. Okay, all about making sure you understand why the data is there and what it's used for. So, time for me to take a break from talking again. Let's bring this into an educational context.
think that helps bring it into a bit more of a context than I ever could by babbling on for another five minutes. But the reason why I put that up there is data in a commercial world can be drawn across into the educational context. And it sits quite comfortably in both. I've known this for a while. I'm sure most people know this for a while. The question is how? So, let's talk about data and education. How can it help you? Why RMIT? Yes, it's a great university. Yes, you've got lots of research. Yes, you've got lots of high credibility. But nowhere in your site does it tell me why a student wants to come to RMIT. It talks about your courses. It talks about your alumni. It talks about your stats. It talks about colleges and doctors and links and this and that. But in the five or ten minutes I was rummaging around, I couldn't easily find a student who stood there and said, this is why you should get out of my team. Great at self-promotion, don't get me wrong, it's one of the best self-promotion websites I've ever seen. But in terms of actually providing insight to a person about the university, all it did was say, well, this is what we are, this is what we do. Just take that word for it, shall I? And most importantly, how do you take that data and help it contribute to your personal and professional success? Nothing new there, I'm sure, but how do you actually go about proving it? So, it staggered me, the information that the, information that the um, Institute has at its disposal. Frightening. A, a business would pay gazillions to have access to this type of information. I can tell you, right? We sell probably about the last two points in equivalent. To give you an idea, it is frightening. I, I remember one the other, the other day, someone told me you surveyed the students about 40 something times in a year. That's ridiculous. But what do you get out of them? So there are all the different stuff you get, but more importantly, what does it tell you? It tells you how many students there were, it tells you who showed up, what they used, how they used it. Great. But how do you turn that into meaningful insight? The most important question to start with when you're trying to figure that out is, do you know what to ask for? It's out there. People like making up. But do you know what to ask for? Do you ask the right questions? I did a postgrad course a couple of years ago now, and the course was great, loved it. Guy was nice, course material was good, clicked on lots of things, used lots of surveys, used lots of learning technologies. But I can guarantee you he had absolutely no insight about what that meant for him as a professional or the university. Yes, your students like you. Fantastic. Tick yes. Do you like it? Yes, you do. But how do you turn all that into tapping into resources available? Right? Show us promotion for these guys here. But you need to think about what you want to learn from the information you have and turn it into something useful. And then more importantly, what can you compare it to? Back to that slide a few slides back. 5% growth versus 1% growth. Very different message depending on which view you take. So, it can be done. I talked a little bit before about the business world. This is about one of Australia's leading retail brands. Probably one of the biggest businesses in Australia. Lots and lots of places around, I won't tell you who they are. But they are huge. They employ several thousand people. Turnover, I think it's about 20 something million just as a business unit. They're part of a bigger family that sells lots more. And this is, I kid you not, the path of an email discussion we had probably over about a month ago about why they were trying to justify investment in a marketing platform. They ended up buying Adobe. Adobe has a marketing automation platform. Never seen it before myself, but I learnt about it there and then as they chose it. And this is part of their justification for choosing that platform. So let's start about the business world. 2.5 million-ish ABNs out there, probably closer to 2.8, but depending on, I'll, I'll sit be technical and say 2.5. Of which about a third are actually active businesses. And by active, that means registered for GST, have had some sort of credit referral, i.e. they want to get credit to buy stuff, or they appear in our trade file, which I talked about a little bit earlier. Okay? There are literally 
hundreds of thousands of ABNs circling through the business world every day, most of which don't do business. Never ceases to amaze me how many there are. And then, of those 800,000, just over half, two thirds, are actually marketable, as in a business that will buy something. I've got an ABN. Trading business because I'm registered for GST. Don't buy anything. Okay. Marketable means a business that is likely to actually buy something. We've got all sorts of metrics around how we do that. So let's talk about clients. So client X thinks they have 800,000 customers. Remember, I said before there's only 500,000 trading businesses. Right, roughly 490. Just remember that. Thinks they have 800,000 customers, but a large percentage of those are cancelled ABNs. So people who've gone into the store, used their ABN to get cheap equipment, because you can get cheap stuff if you're a business, and then never use that ABN or that card or whatever it is they used again. Probably about 15% of their data does. And then they said to me, oh, but hang on, we've got 15 of, we'll call it Bank Y, 15 of Bank Y in our database. Isn't that 15 different businesses? No, 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 it's still Bank Y. There's 15 of them, yeah, sure, but it's still the one business. So that was part of the argument we had. Once again, trying to use information to tell their own story. The true profile, now remember, 800,000 customers. That's what they reckon they have. Their true profile looks something like this. 105,000-ish unique, you can tell I'm Italian, I use lots of ish, ish, unique, marketable businesses. That's from a business that swore, hand and heart, for about two weeks via email, via means. I met with the national marketing manager, I met with the director, I met with the managing director, all of whom were swearing black and blue. Yes, we've got 800,000 customers, Phil. No, you don't. Yes, you've got 800,000 different people buying different things at different times and different places, but in terms of actual businesses you can talk to, just over 105,000. And then the funny thing was, is they then tried to convince me that they have every industry covered. And just looking at that, there's a fairly even dispersal, if you can see there, with one of the largest industries being professional and scientific and technical service, which is technical term for people who do stuff, basically where everything, or the businesses that aren't called something go. But you can see, if I just go back, the point I was trying to make before, it's all about how you take the data, how you access it, the resources you have available to you, and then interpret it. So then you deliver insight. 800,000 customers, I'll say again, 800,000 customers, reality about 100. Which was great for me because then I was able to sit down and do some analysis for them and talk to them about how they can target more customers. But there was a very, 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 very grumpy mailhouse who swore at me in ways I won't repeat in public when I told them they didn't have 800,000 pieces of mail sent. Because they were basically their whole campaign around it. Okay? There are some serious dollars at stake. It's not just the piece of data, it's the mailing piece, it's the creative, it's the agency, it's the television ads. This is a business that invests billions in advertising and marketing and sales, has entire fleets of people running around trying to sell its stuff, has stores everywhere, but for some reason their senior marketing person and director of sales and marketing is convinced that their database is eight times bigger than what it is, and it's actually more businesses than there are trading in the entire world, in so, well, Australia. So, what was the result? Apart from a very grumpy mail house and some long and interesting conversations. You need to be careful what insight you draw from that data. Understand your true market performance. What is it? Don't be afraid of it. Okay? Numbers can be twisted and turned and twisted and viewed and manipulated however you want. I took one of my younger guys today through profiling of a business database of a cleaning company trying to explain to him why 21 businesses out of about 4 million was not a good comparison. All right? The business was adamant, they're our best customers. We want to know where we can find more of them. 
the discussion I had was to pull it back and go, oh, slow down for a minute. You've given us 21. There are millions of records here in your database. Disconnection, guys. Let's think about how we work with it. And understand the true opportunity available to you. Every single one of my customers, hand on heart, will stand in front of me and go, we've got 30% of our database here, Phil. Aren't we great? Go, yeah, cool. Then they'll turn around and say, oh, but we've only got 3% in manufacturing. Just pick one off the top of my head. Okay. But how many actual manufacturing firms are there in your area? Oh, not many. Okay. How does that compare to what you've got compared to recipes? Oh, pretty good, actually. We're doing better in this industry than we were in manufacturing. And so forth and so on, and on we go. What they're trying to do is figure out where there's opportunity for growth as opposed to continue doing well. If you've got 50% of your business in one area, great. Go tackle it, keep selling. But you won't grow unless you identify where there's opportunities where you could do more. And then last but not least, improvements in efficiency and effectiveness. Businesses lose countless. I've got one of my guys, God bless him, loving to death, but he will spend a day processing in one single contract because he has to do everything in a certain way. If it falls out of sync, he'll stop and come back and start again. If you manage the data right, if you harness the information correctly, you will improve how you perform as a business or as an institution. You will save countless hours of people time and God knows how much in terms of things like software licenses and data licenses. Never ceases to shock me how many businesses spend millions of dollars on software and data and people that they do not need. Or if they don't need it, they don't know how to use them. People who just misallocate the wrong people at the wrong time. Oops. So, let me finish with a bit of self shameless self promotion and uh, hand you back over to you guys. So, if you want some help, Talk to the guys in business intelligence. Talk to the guys around the college. Undertake a data audit. Be brave. Be brave and shave. Be brave and data audit. A data audit will give you a very good idea of where you stand in the world and plant some very serious home truths. The amount of companies who, after I do a data audit, will sit there and go, holy, I didn't realise it. And they'll sit there and think, well, hang on, we've got all these salespeople and all this marketing and all this collateral going in completely the wrong place. Back to that client X example. They paid a mailhouse an absorbent amount of money to prepare a creative for 800,000 businesses. They were going to mail 800,000 businesses, thinking that it was going to go to almost 800,000 different places. Right. And talk to a data expert. So just to finish up, guys, Data is big, data is scary, data can lead you in all sorts of different interesting paths. What's most important is to stop and think about how you're going to use it, where you're going to use it, and when you're going to use it. And once you figure those things out, then you can start determining what it will do for you. Questions? Data information and insight. What is insight? It's a good question. Lots of businesses will say to me, I want to harness insight from my data or my information. There's all sorts of technical descriptions about what's what. But as far as I'm concerned, it's all about drawing meaning from patterns. So you look for patterns in what the information is telling you or the data is telling you and pull some meaning out of that. That can be some very basic insight. We've got 10 customers here, 20 customers there. Or it can be some very powerful insight in terms of these customers have a propensity to pay bills on time because of these customers over here and some work I've done. So for me, insight's about looking for patterns and then being ruthlessly scientific about how you interpret and drawing it into a business or educational context. Anything else? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I am interested you gave a good example there, but if you've got another example about where um, you work with a client and how uh, yeah, the analysis of data has made a difference <coughs> there. Uh, I'll assume it must always. Oh, it doesn't always make a difference. It's usually be the case, but yeah, just. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about a fuel car supplier that I work quite closely with. Just did a campaign with them the other day. So 
They are a fuel card supplier. You go to the petrol station, you get a card. That's for common kind of credit card, but petrol. And their brief to me was, we need to grow our database by 3%. Okay, what does that mean? We don't know. Our sales, got, sales director sat down, sat down and said, we need to grow by 3%. Okay. So let's figure out how much your current database is worth, step one. Okay, current state. What's there, what you have, what you don't have, what are you going to make out of it, how much is it worth? Did that. Step two, okay, let's actually profile and do that data audit I talked about and get an understanding of where you're under and over penetrated. Where is there areas for you to grow? <coughs> they did really well in a whole heap of segments. Let's keep attacking those. Let's talk about where there's opportunity for you to grow. And we did a heap of work. It took us about two months where we analysed data, we wrote some reports, do all sorts of tables and graphs and came back with a holistic analysis that, that said to them, here is where you will find opportunities to grow based on your existing data. Note the word there, based on your existing data. All right? Based on evidence, evidence straight, based insight. Can't um, emphasise enough. From that, we then went to market. They went to about 80,000 people, 80,000 businesses over about a six month period and they got a 4% return, which sounds pretty average, but that 4% return was a $4.3 million uplift because we'd done the insight right. They love me now. Every time I ring up the phone, they do something for me. But because we picked the right segment at the right time, we were able to make them that money. And more importantly, they know there's trailing income to come. Not everyone's going to buy at the same time. right? If you deal with businesses or any institution for that matter, there's some that are ready to move straight away, there's some that are ready to hold on, and there are some that will just say no. They worked out that even though they did 4.3 million issues straight away, there was about another <coughs> 1.82 mil to come through the funnel. The whole campaign, including data purchase, cost them about $250,000, and they made six. Well, by this time in August, July, June, and May, this time in middle of May, they would have made about six. So it goes to show you how by a stepped, weighted, well thought out, evidence-based approach, you can turn something that doesn't seem overly fantastic into very powerful and you know, useful insight. And they've said to me quite often, this is the best quarter we've had in ages. And they keep saying, it's all because of me. And I go, no, 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 no. I just press the buttons and put stuff in the right place. You guys had the data. You asked the right questions. You asked for the right help. And you were willing to listen. Can't emphasise that. So, yes, yeah, yeah. Another example of how we turn something as simple as data into useful insight. Yes? Oh, look, we don't have one specific one, we're agnostic. So most of them are software as service. Um, so ours is called Market Insight, there's SAS, there's Marketo, there's hundreds. Um, I don't usually recommend one over the other because I prefer to look at the content. Oh, look, I prefer a, a basic software as service tool. Most of them are fairly the same way. You can size and shape a database by cubes and whatever else, and then go off and do some profiling. Probably the most like, common ones that, we're called, that we use is called Apteco. A-P-T-E-C-O, Apteco. But there's hundreds of them. There. So there's, there's one there. So, number of the examples we've given us about growing market share, do you have any examples of improved quality? Sorry? Improved quality. Oh, yeah. 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 Yep. Improving quality? Yes. In quality in terms of performance or quality in terms of data or both? Performance, but Performance? Yeah, sorry, in terms of improving yeah. how something is in, in yeah. Satisfaction of Satisfaction. Yeah, yeah, no, I've got, got one of those. So we dealt with a photocopier supplier. I'm trying to give away who they are again. And they were all around net promoter score. Right, the net promoter score is where you give a survey to your clients and they say, happy, not happy, somewhat happy, go away, don't talk to you. And their NPS is scored from 5 to 1, and at that time their NPS, NPS score was sitting around about 2. They wanted to get to 3.8. I don't know where they got 3.8 from. That's the metric they made up. But they wanted to get from 2 to 3.8. And there was all sorts of you know, problematization about the end of the world and how we're going to do this, and my sales guys are too busy. So what we did is we took a backward step and we said, OK, what do you actually ask your customers? Don't know. When was the last time you ran a survey? Oh, about three months ago. Hey, let's look at the survey. How many of those did you send out? Don't know. What was the input? Don't know. What questions did you ask? I'm not sure. So, at that stage, we just pressed the pause button and said to the guys, 
you don't know what you're asking them or you're not sure what you're asking them and you can't remember when you sent it. Uh, is there any wonder why your NPS score is so low? Who runs it? Oh, it just runs automatically out of Salesforce. Right? No direct interaction, no direct involvement, no input into the process. So what we did was we sat down and said to the business, okay, what are the key performance measures for you as a business? What makes you successful in the eyes of your know, bosses or whatever? That was the first step. The second step was then identifying what they told their customers. And what it turned out was they don't actually bring their customers. Their customers spend hundreds of thousands of dollars with them and no one actually follows up. They dump the photocopy and run out the door. No surprise they don't get anything. Third thing was, when do you actually collect it? Oh, about a year or so later. Why a year later? Well, because that's when we send the invoice for the renewal. So you follow up on your customers a year after you've implemented the solution and just before you ask them to pay a bill and you're wondering why the score is low. Okay. So all that came together and then we went for the look for the trends in the data. And the data was backed up there, all that stuff we just showed. Well, no wonder, by the time you ask them for feedback, you're actually identifying here that you're clicking it too late. And without fault, about 95% of their referrals were about within two to three weeks of their renewal invoice. Guys, come on, let's think about it. So what we did was we then reverse profiled to say, okay, when is the best time to do it? And surprise, surprise, a month after they did it. So that's when we turned around. And from there, they got to about 3.7 last time, I suppose. So they improved it. But it was all about, once again, identifying when was the best time to capture the data, and more importantly, what data to capture. Didn't have to reinvent the wheel. It was just more a process around saying, okay, guys, you need to really think about how you collect these data. Anything else? Uh, it's about the list of data sources that are on the T, as we've said, mm -hmm. uh, our business is good for. Uh, the issue we have is that they are often discrete and independent systems that you can't get together. I'm interested in the facts and issues in the businesses you work with and what are the solutions. Yes, is the short answer, is a huge issue. There are people, businesses out there, multi billion dollar businesses who contact us and just go, mate, it is a Next, I've got seven different databases, I've got analysts here, analysts there, some guy's been there for 15 years and doesn't want to do it. All that, so yes, it's a problem. In terms of solutions, what we find works best is to really sit down and firstly identify all the different data sources. And you'd be, you'd be amazed how many businesses don't know what they have. All right? The university has some really good stuff. I bet you'd bet if you question some of your professors and whoever else strongly enough, guarantee at least some of them know. Businesses are the same. They, you've got one person who knows one area really well, another person who knows another area really well, sitting in their side. So the first thing we do is just open the books and go, okay, let's figure out all the data you have available. Second thing we do is, okay, well, what questions or what issues does the business have? And if they don't know, we pr provoke them. Okay, well, okay, what was your turnover the last 12 months? What was your set again? What's your NPS? Go back to other examples. What was your, you know, sales? The last three months, all those sorts of questions. So once we do that, then we sit down and okay, let's try and figure out what data sources will answer those questions. Then comes the big step of doing the work to marry the two. So there's no magic wand for that step, but our general practice is to really perform data work again, identify those sources, identify the questions, and do our best to marry the two. And there invariably are at least half a dozen things you can't marry up, and that's where you've got to go back to the business and say, right, you don't know how to answer this, can I go talk to the person that looks after that area, question them for a while, and once you question them for a while, you be, they either have it, or you have to tell them to go figure out where to buy it from, or how to manufacture it. Once you've done all that, the actual work becomes easy, because then all you're really doing is marrying questions to resources to information, and then delivering patterns or insight back to the business to say, okay, if you want this report, or if you want this outcome, or if you value this insight, here is that process, business process you need to follow. And then ultimately, you come up with a set of business rules that say, to produce this, you must do that. And you go. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Yeah. General question, might sound silly. What stage of the data burn are we currently in? Oh, a bit like the housing boom. Uh, uh, oh, look, I think it's... I think it's it, it's tricky to say that I think what I'll, I'll answer by saying what's old is new again. Um, in that I think it's going to be cyclical rather than that. I think what will happen is the privacy laws last year changed the playing field a heck of a lot. 
Um, it relates a lot more to the consumer world than the business world, because it's well, around people rather than businesses. But once it catches up for businesses, I think that will be an important watershed. So in terms of, to answer your question, I think it's getting to the stage where it'll either go through the roof or be completely chopped off mm -hmm. and a whole heap of businesses will have to change the way it does business because of privacy and expectation around data management. Um, things like identity theft and all that other scary stuff. It's sort of come to the stage now where there's such a plethora of information and such a variety of laws and rules around it that eventually a, a moment in time is going to come where someone in some government body goes, hang on a minute. Is there, so is there an optimal point you can see in the future? Yeah, look, I don't know when in the future, but for me it's about data, immediate, accurate, now, immediate, accurate and validated. So businesses don't want large volumes of data anymore, they want validated data. I'll have a customer who will pay $100,000 for smaller volumes of validated data than $100,000 of just large pools of it. So for me, the optimal sort of utopia will be easy access through APIs and connectors and mobile phones and various other things that is reasonably affordable but also insightful and validated. I keep saying the word validated, in that someone, you can look at that and go, yeah, that's correct because, one, two, three, four, how far away that is? Look, I reckon the next three to five years. Um, you know, I mean, the, the, the technology is there. I think what's missing is the, is the use case around it and the business rules around it, but that's just my So, for an institution like our MIT, expect vast improvements in teaching quality and income in five years from better data usage? If it did it right, yeah. I mean, less than that. I mean, you can turn it around quicker than that. I mean, ultimately, to improve incomes from data, you start at the beginning and identify what resources you have to drive the input output you acquire and where you're missing the resources fill the gap. But yeah, look, five years is, you know, I mean, I would say three, two to three years. I've, I've, you know, I've done it for most organisations about 18 months. Um, you know, there's a large multinational, probably the same size. So, but yeah, so 18 months to three years is sort of the general cycle that we tend to see where they go from being very immature to sophisticated. Does that help? Yeah, yeah. Anything else? Cool. Thank you. You used to be a teacher. Yes. If you're a teacher now, what would you expect of Big Data to help? What would I expect of That's a good question. There's my details, by the way. You're welcome to email me. Um, if I was teaching now, what I would expect from big data is an easy to fill out pro forma where I can say, here is the insight I want, business intelligence unit. Here are the questions I would like answered. This is why I want them answered, because it's going to help me do one, two, three, four, five. Help. So it'd be more around the process I would go about to achieve the outcomes I want. So, as a teacher, I want lots of students, I want them to be happy, I want them to be attending my course, I want them to be respected about my peers. So, how does that translate into the evidence I can collect to prove it? And then working with the resources available to me to, to do that. So, for me, it would be around having some sort of process that allows me to say, here are the achievements I want to you know, get to, here's why, and this is the things I need help someone. Very good, guys. Cool. All right, thank you, everyone. Okay, thanks for that. It was interesting to find out all sorts of stuff there. Um, the, um, the fact that the email must be used for its purpose for the, as per the privacy laws is interesting given that we've now got the data and teacher laws which sort of cuts across that of course. Anyway, thanks very much for a really interesting presentation and uh, um, yeah, Phil's contact details are up there if anyone's interested and uh, we'll be in touch for about our next presentation. Thanks, everyone.